In this video, we are about to prove the first theorem of the course, and that's the theorem about the existence of conditional expectations. Now, conditional expectation is a tool we will be using in pretty much every lecture this semester, so it's a good thing to start by ensuring that mathematically this object exists and is well defined. Now, from an applied point of view, a conditional expectation is a way to look at a random variable when you only have access to a restricted amount of information. So, let me give you an example. Think of the random variable modeling the value of some financial asset after a week. So, what it does is that it takes different values depending on all sort of events that might have occurred uh, throughout that week. Now, let's think that you want to look at this random variable halfway through the week. So, halfway through the week, it should take values that only depend on what happened in the past and doesn't depend on what's going to happen in the future. So how do you adjust your random variable that's designed to be uh, taking values based on events throughout the week if you're halfway through the week, given that you only have the information available to you halfway through the week? That's what conditional expectation does for you. We tell you how to modify your information based on this uh, restriction of information. Now, what is it mathematically? So mathematically, we have a random variable. So it's a map from a probability space into something, say the, the real number, and it's measurable with respect to the sigma algebra. That's part of your definition of a probability space. Now, the idea of restricting information is going to be modeled by restricting the sigma algebra, taking a smaller sigma algebra. So the question mathematically is, if I have a variable that's measurable with respect to some sigma algebra, sigma, and I look at a sub-sigma algebra, how do I approximate my variable measurable with respect to sigma by a variable with measurable with respect to sigma naught, with respect to a smaller sigma algebra? So we're going to see that first for variables that also happen to be square integrable. And that's really for analytical sort of reason that if I'm in L2 over a probability space, that's a Hilbert space. And if you've done some Hilbert space theory, then you might know that in Hilbert spaces, we have orthogonal projections just like we have in finite dimensional uh, vector spaces. And what is the conditional expectation? Really, it's the conditional expect it's the orthogonal projection, sorry, um, that corresponds to projecting from L2 of omega sigma p down to the smaller subspace L2 of omega sigma naught p. Now, this geometric intuition is going to be helpful uh, in various parts of the course and understanding what conditional expectations do. That's some of the analysis point of view on conditional expectation. Yep orthogonal projection into a subspace, a few Hilbert space of square integral random variables. But from a probabilistic point of view, it's also important to think about how do you end all a lack of information from a probabilistic perspective? Well, you just average out everything you don't know. And we'll see in the examples later on that this is very much uh, a good way of thinking of conditional expectation, and in particular, a good way of computing conditional expectations. But for now, let's have a look at the formal statement of the theorem. Here is the statement of the theorem. So we have a probability space, omega sigma p, and we consider a sub sigma algebra. So a subset of sigma that also happens to be a, a sigma algebra. And what the theorem tells us is that there exists a continuous linear operation, and it is unique, that sends a random variable in the large space L2 of omega sigma p down to the subspace L2 of omega sigma naught p. And that's going to be an orthogonal projection in the sense of Hilbert spaces. And the defining property of that projection is that for any random variable x in L2 of omega sigma p and any a in sigma naught, then integrating x over a is the same thing as integrating t of x over a. And that's really saying that from the point of view of any question you might ask about your random variable, given that all the information you have is described by sigma naught, then x is indistinguishable from t of x. Of course, they could be different if you had more information, if you look at them in L2 of omega sigma p. But that's uh, at the level of what you can see on the projected subspace, d variables are the same. Now let's turn to the proof. Okay, so let's prove this theorem. We have two Hilbert spaces here. We have L2 of omega sigma naught p and we have L2 of omega sigma p. Now I claim that the 
one with respect to the smaller sigma algebra is included with the one with respect to the larger sigma algebra. This seems almost obvious, and, and this is, I mean, this is really a consequence of the fact that uh, being sigma not measurable is harder than being sigma measurable. So more precisely, if you have a y that is an L2 of omega sigma naught, uh, and you give yourself to a real numbers a and b, the inverse image of the open interval a, b is going to be in sigma naught. That's what being sigma naught measurable means, but sigma naught is included in sigma. So your y is going to be also sigma measurable, and the expectation of y squared is not going to change as you change the, the sigma algebra. So y is going to be in L2 of omega sigma p. So you have this inclusion of Hilbert spaces. So we're going to consider the inclusion map, the map that goes from the small one to the large one, sending a random variable y to itself. Now this map is linear, obviously, and it's continuous because the L2 norm of y doesn't change. Okay, so at this stage, if you've done a fair amount of Hilbert space theory through course like analysis 2 in particular, you know where the rest of the proof uh, is going to go. I have the inclusion map J, and I'm going to consider it's a joint. And Hilbert space theory tells you that the joints exist, and I'm going to be able to identify this a joint with the orthogonal projection onto the subset, and that's going to be my conditional expectations. Now, I don't want to assume that all of you here know what these words mean, um, and if you don't, the only thing I'm going to have to assume is that you've seen in some uh, analysis course, such as analysis two or maybe uh, maybe others, um, the risk representation theorem. So the risk representation theorem tells you that a continuous linear map from a Hilbert space to the real can be identified with the inner product against a fixed element of that Hilbert space. So that's really a potentially infinite dimensional version of a theorem you're, you're very familiar with in finite dimension, that is to say that if you have a linear map from Rn to R, you can identify it by uh, with the multiplication by a, a vector, the take the inner product with a, with a vector. Now, if you haven't seen that, the race representation theorem, then you're going to have to take the proof of this very first theorem to a large extent for granted, but you won't have uh, much more trouble elsewhere through the course, so don't worry about it particularly much. So let's give ourselves an x in L2 of omega sigma p, and I need to find this, this t of x satisfying the, the property in the statement of my theorem. I need to find the conditional expectation of x given uh, sigma naught. So the way uh, I will define it is as follows. So I'm first going to consider a linear functional. I'm going to consider Lx, a map from L2 omega sigma naught p to the real numbers um, that takes a variable y to the inner product of j of y with x. And let me remind you what the inner product is. I mean, it is the expectation of the product of the two variables. Right, and that makes sense because g of y is in L2 of omega sigma p, x is in L2 of omega sigma p also, so the product of two L2 variables is something in L1. And that is to say it's integrable, so taking this expectation as a valid operation. So I consider the, this map, and this map is linear and continuous. It's easy to see. And therefore, by Reese representation theorem, it has to be given by an inner product. So that means there exists a unique, actually, T of X in L2 of omega sigma naught of P, such that for every Y in L2 of omega sigma naught p, Lx of y is equal to the inner product of t of x with y. Right, and let me remind you that Lxy was by definition j of y against 
x. So you know this property here tells you that uh, x t of x is really like j star of x if you know what uh, what adjoints are. Now in particular, I can consider for every a in sigma naught the specific variable which is the indicator of the set a that is to say the map that sends omega to 1 if omega belongs to a and to 0 if omega does not belong to a and if I consider this map I have that j of the indicator of a for any a in sigma naught comma x is the same thing as t of x comma indicator of a and what are these things well j is not going to change the indicator function of a because the indicator function of a uh, is already um, sigma naught measurable so this is nothing but indicator function of a so on the left hand side I have the integral of a of x and on the right hand side I have the integral of a of t of x so t of x does satisfy this uh, fundamental property of conditional expectation property 1.1 that I want in the statement of the theorem so we have the existence of a map t um, that satisfy property 1.1 what we have to show now is that this map is unique, it's linear, and it's continuous. So let's start with uniqueness. So this defining property uh, of T tells us that if I have another map from L2 omega sigma P down to L2 omega sigma naught P, that satisfies 1.1, and that is linear and continuous, then what can I say about that map? I can say that Sx times the indicator of uh, 1a is equal to t of x in a product with indicator of 1a for every a in sigma naught. But if it's true for every indicator function by linearity, I'm going to have that S of x, uh, let's say minus t of x, in a product with a simple function is going to have to be zero and that's true for every simple function so for every natural number n for any choice of scalar cj's uh, and for any choice of aj in sigma naught now simple function are dense in l2 of omega sigma naught so you can take a limit and by density of simple functions, we have that for every y in L2 of sigma naught p s of x minus t of x in a product with y has to be zero. Uh, but that implies, because you can ch choose y equal s of x minus t of x, for instance, that s of x has to be equal to t of x. So we have uniqueness of the conditional expectation. Is it linear and is it continuous? Well, let's uh, find out. So first of all, linearity. So let's give ourselves 2x1 and x2 in L2 of omega sigma p and a scalar, let's call it lambda. Right, now notice that t of lambda x1 plus x2 apply to some y for any y in L2 of omega sigma naught p uh, is equal to this linear functional lambda of sorry L of lambda x1 plus x2 applied to y. So if we can show that the map x goes to Lx is linear then we will also get that the map t is linear so let's see that so what is l lambda x1 plus x2 of y it is by definition the expectation 
of j of y times lambda x1 plus x2 but now expectations are linear so this is lambda expectation j y x1 plus expectation j y x2 which is the same thing as lambda times lambda x1 of y plus l x2 of y which is the same thing as lambda tx1 indicator um, inner product with y plus t of x2 inner product with y so t is linear now the last thing we have to do is to show that this map t is continuous so let's have a look at the expectation of t of x1 minus t of x2 square right which is by definition the norm of t of x1 minus t of x2 squared in l2 so what is this it's the inner product of t of x1 minus x2 by linearity uh, with itself which is really l of t of x1 minus x2 sorry l of x1 minus x2 applied at the point t of x1 minus x2 which is the expectation of j of t of x1 minus x2 uh, times x1 minus x2 now you can apply cauchy schwarz inequality and what do you get you get that this is controlled by the norm of j of t of x1 minus x2 times the norm of x1 minus x2 now you can equal that to the norm of t of x1 minus x2 times the norm of x1 minus x2 that's because j is an isometry and then you divide by the norm of uh, t of x1 minus x2 on both sides and you get that t of x1 minus x2 norm of this is smaller than the norm of x1 minus x2 so t is continuous and this concludes our proof